when we're aligning two sequences together, it's called a pairwise alignment. And for sequences that are not very different from each other, if there's not much divergence, this is a rather simple process. So I've got two sequences here. One is one base pair shorter than the other. But other than that, they're identical. And so when we align them up, it's a fairly simple, straightforward uh, process. And we talked about in the last one how we could maybe get a score or a cost for this alignment and then compare it to other different alignments that might put the, the gap in a different place. Uh, we'll look at the gap here in a little bit. Or might have a slightly different arrangement of base pairs. And we could have some sort of an objective measurement at the end, a cost, to determine whether one was better than the other. And so these costs are based on three basic elements. How much a substitution is, a gap, and then an extension of a gap, meaning that it might we might consider one space in a sequence different than two spaces. Whereas, you know, if the cost for a gap is one, the cost for two gaps may not be two. It might just be a slightly lower number. Now, the trick is there's no real objective way. It's difficult to assign uh, the various costs to these things. But these are the three things that must be considered when we're doing a pairwise comparison. So I've got these sequences here in Mega just to kind of illustrate what we're talking about. So notice we've put a gap here at the end, and that represents an insertion or a deletion event. In sequence two, we don't know whether it was an insertion in sequence one, so it's one base pair longer, or a deletion in sequence two. In later discussions, and a little bit at the end of the discussion today, we'll talk about how we might get some information about whether it was an insertion or a deletion. But as far as the alignment goes, it doesn't matter. It's just represented by this gap in the alignment. Now notice, I could also put the gap here, right? And so that would be, the cost would be the same. So the cost of this alignment is the same as the previous one. We only have one insertion deletion event. Now, because DNA sequence is somewhat repetitive, if the sequence is really, really divergent, this can be a little bit difficult. So notice, I could do something like this. And then we would have to put in gaps here at the end, something like that, or maybe even a little bit better, right? I could do something like that. But notice this is a much more costly alignment than the one we had previous, right? We have one, two, three, four, five uh, gaps that we would have to account for here, whereas with the previous alignment, we only had a single gap. And so obviously we would prefer the first alignment, Let's see if we can go back to it, Right? This is a much better solution to the problem because it's got a lower cost overall. And so we could write, and people have done this, a simple computer program, an algorithm, that would test many different alignments, come up with a gas, a, a, a cost for each of those alignments, and then it would eliminate the alignments that were higher in cost and say, oh, those aren't as good, so we're going to prefer the simpler one, which, again, would look something like that with a gap here at the end. Okay, now we are getting more and more and more DNA sequence. And so doing an alignment is, is kind of easy if the sequences are not too divergent. But if they're very divergent, those alignments become harder and harder and are less helpful. They're less meaningful as far as a homology statement is. So let's review. Once we do have our final alignment, let's review what it means. And then we'll look at multiple sequence alignments. So when I've got an alignment like this, we're saying that these pieces of DNA are, are homologous. And not only that, but within this DNA, each column, so that column there represents a homologous nucleotide between species 1 and species 2. And this column is another homologous nucleotide, so we can directly compare those and say, well, if they're similar or different, that might mean different things. Okay. So we try to do alignments. Now, alignments are used not only to establish homology for phylogenetics and protein comparisons, which are what the paper talks about and what we're talking about mainly here. They're also used when we're assembling genomes and when we're assembling transcriptomes. And don't worry if you don't know the difference of those yet. That's okay. But the difference when you're assembling a genome is you expect to have only very small differences, maybe if you've got allelic variation in the same genome. But for the most part, you're trying to find exact matches to line up and assemble the entire genome.
Whereas when you're doing alignment between species, you're going to expect there to be differences at some level between those species. And as we do this experimentally, we can begin to establish if sequences are homologous, we're going to expect to have some level, maybe even a very high level of similarity. And so this is what we would expect <clears throat> the distribution for homologous sequences to be, where most of them are going to be very, very similar. Some of them are going to be quite different. And so we can maybe experimentally, after we gather lots and lots of information and align them together, come up with some expected distribution for how similar homologous sequences should be. Now, as even homologous sequences begin to evolve and mutate, they're going to become more and more and more different. And so if I go back to my original alignment and I start to put in mutations, so let's say we have an insertion here, it's a G representing there. Now, because we know exactly how that happened, we can simply account for that. Maybe here we've got a uh, substitution, right? Here maybe let's put in another substitution. And again, if we knew historically and we were able to observe how each of these occurred, our alignments would be easy to do. And even as they become very, very different from one another, we could still do a relatively reasonable alignment. But remember, we can't go back in time and observe all the mutations that have occurred. All we have is the data, the evidence that we have today, those sequences. And so we do our best to infer this. And if they get so different, eventually we get to a point where doing alignment is very, very difficult. And there's no good way to get a meaningful alignment out of sequences that have diverged so far that they are no longer able, we're no longer able to reconstruct those uh, homologies. So ideally what we have, and you saw this on worksheet one, is we have genes where some places are so similar that maybe even identical that they're easy to align. And then we have regions where there's more variability. That's data, but the similar areas help us to align the areas that are a little bit more different. Okay, And so we do these local alignments, which means, well, maybe we're missing data, and so we don't have to try and make it match exactly versus a global alignment where we try to make everything match. And we could get scores from these, whether we have a, a, a global or a local alignment. Now, the BLAST algorithm, which you've used a little bit, we've introduced, is a local alignment. It takes your query sequence and tries to find the best match. It doesn't have to match an entire piece of DNA. It can match within a piece of DNA. And so notice that this is a much better match. We only have, I guess, just um, the one, two gaps uh, and then it doesn't look like we have any, I'm trying to scan down here, it looks like all of the sequences are identical, right? So we can do both of those, but BLAST searches are local sequence alignments. When we try to do protein alignments, there's a little bit more complexity because there are 20 amino acids where there are only four nucleotide base pairs that we need to account for in a, in a DNA alignment. Okay, so... Nucleotide alignments are more simple than amino acid or protein alignments, but realize that they're connected. But one of the other things that we might need to consider, and we'll look at this near the end of the discussion, is that for most protein coding genes, the nucleotides are more conserved, meaning there's less difference in the amino acid sequences than there is in the DNA sequences. So even though those might have more complex models and might have more scores that we need to account for when we're doing an alignment, we also uh, need to take into account the amount of divergence. And so it may be easier to do the alignment at the, at the amino acid level than it is at the nucleotide level. Okay. Now, we want to move from pairwise alignments to multiple sequence alignments. And to do this, we try to sum the score of all the pairwise alignments over the entire alignment. And the math for this is a little bit more advanced than we need to get into. So you don't need to worry about this. But just be aware that we get a score out of it that's very similar. And we use the same basic um, parameters, the gap, the substitution, and the gap extension. And we use those same basic parameters when we're doing a multiple sequence alignment. Now, the issue with it is as we add more and more sequences, we run into this uh, very, very quick exponential growth in the number of possible alignments that we would need to evaluate. So for a short DNA sequence, maybe even a little bit of a longer one, if we're just doing a pairwise alignment, we could, in theory, evaluate many, many millions of different alignments and be relatively certain that we found the very best one overall. 
However, as we have three or four or five or more sequences, we mean, may need to evaluate billions and trillions and <clears throat> 10 to the 80th power of different possible alignments, even to do a reasonable search. So it becomes a little bit more prohibitive, in fact, quickly, a lot more prohibitive to do a multiple sequence alignment. And so there are some approaches that people take because they can't evaluate every single possible alignment. So they take some approaches that give them a reasonable shot at finding a good or maybe even the very best alignment based on those three measurement criteria. And so this is a type of a problem called an NP-complete problem. Basically, an NP-complete problem is any problem, whether it's in biology or a different uh, discipline, that the number of possible solutions that we would need to evaluate to find the very best one overall, that number of solutions is so high that as we begin to add data sets or begin to add data to our analysis, that we very quickly get to a point where we cannot evaluate every single possible solution. And so we're left with some sort of a search that's not going to be a complete search to try and find the very best solution. And so we do this with multiple sequence alignments. And we're not going to learn the guts and all of the details of the algorithms that are used. But I do want you to be aware of the three basic classes of multiple sequence alignment. Okay. Now, before we talk about those three classes, I just want to iterate something or emphasize something. We will never ever know that we have what we would call the true alignment, or even if you want to say the most correct alignment. We can never know for sure because we weren't there. Now, when we see an alignment like this, we say, oh, look, there is a substitution here at this position, position number, I think it's, uh, what, three, six, that's position nine. There is a substitution. Uh, and we don't know whether that truly is a substitution, although that seems to be the most likely explanation. Maybe there was an insertion in one sequence and then losses in the other sequence. That's a much less likely scenario. We have to be, have a kind of a lot of coincidences to do it. But we wouldn't know for sure because we don't ever visualize those historic events. So in reality, there is no such thing as a true alignment. But we hope that using these algorithms and the scores for those three different parameters, we can come up with a reasonable, maybe even very close or exactly to uh, a representation of the true historical evolutionary events, those mutations that occurred in the past. So the cost is going to get us the very best estimate of what is somewhere a true alignment that we can never know 100% for sure. Okay? So here are the three basic types of multiple sequence alignment. You don't need to memorize which algorithms one of these, well, two of these you'll be a little bit familiar with because they're implemented in the MEGA program. Don't worry about memorizing all of these if you come across them in later classes, which is unlikely unless you go on to do some graduate research that, that delves into this sort of a thing. But just know the basic types. A progressive alignment, as the name suggests, is just basically a way to do pairwise alignments and do them one after the other until you have your final alignment. Most of these use a guide tree, which is based on sequence differences. So we would take the two sequences that are most similar to one another, and we would align them together. We would then reevaluate the distances between the, the other sequences and the new aligned sequences. And then we come up and say, in this case, oh, species three and species one are the next close, most closely related to one another. And so we would line them up together. And then we would reiterate, reiterate this, and you basically go stepwise through this until you have all of your alignments together. So you do an initial alignment, secondary alignment, you put the next ones together, and so on and so forth until you have your complete alignment. The advantage of progressive alignments is that they are relatively fast because they are just pairwise alignments that we do one right after the other, step by step, until we get to our final solution. The disadvantage of these is that we can get locked into alignment based on one of our early alignments, and then once those are there, we can't go back and readjust or change those based on new information coming in from, from the uh, remaining sequences. So progressive alignments are rather quick, but they can get locked into a suboptimal solution based on an alignment made early on. So a way to get around those mistakes that we get in locked into is a form of an iterative alignment. And many of these also use a guide tree, but then they're allowed to, in some cases, reevaluate and um, reevaluate the guide tree, maybe have a different guide tree. Uh, 
So we do a very quick assessment. We use a guide tree, and then we do it re-evaluate the entire alignment. And then we use that alignment to generate the guide tree. Now realize this is, a, to some extent, an attempt to get around to catch 22. To do a good alignment, we need to know something about how the sequences are related. But a priori, ahead of time, we really don't know how they're related. And so the alignment, the intent of doing the alignment often is so that we can figure out how the sequences are related. So that's a little bit of a paradox or catch-22. And this iterative alignment attempts to get around that by allowing us to re-evaluate and redo the uh, phylogeny or the guide tree that's helping us to do the multiple sequence alignment. And so these alignments are going to be allowed to vary and um, get adjusted based on these reworked or revisited guide trees. So iterative alignments have a better chance of getting us closer to what might be the optimal solution, but they're a little bit more computationally intensive. And here's a list of, of many programs that do this. Now the paper also mentions that there are now cloud computing resources, so we can implement you know, parallel computing resources at, on servers that are uh, remote to where the person is who is doing the alignment. So we can bring to bear a lot of uh, computational power to help us do these. Okay, But iterative alignments are beginning to be a little bit more computationally intense. The last type, and again, we never know for sure that we have the correct alignment. BLAST is a very good one that, that uses these remote cloud computing pro processes to give you alignments. Um, and we can come up with even estimates of whether or not we have a, a, a good match that is can be reasonably considered to be homologous that we could include in the alignment. So the final type is um, a stochastic approach, which basically means that rather than following a fairly straightforward um, sequence of events to come out with the best alignment, even if we're kind of going back over and revising and revising, we use um, a search strategy that's maybe a little bit more um, advanced. And one of those stochastic approaches, the only one that we're, we're going to talk about, is an evolutionary algorithm. And this is an interesting one for biologists because it works very similar to the nature of evolution. So basically, we take an initial alignment, and then maybe we randomly shuffle a few things around. And that would simulate a random mutation. And then once we randomly uh, shuffle a few things around, we then go on to do more and more alignments based on maybe, okay, we change one thing. If it gets better, we keep that one and throw away the old one. And we keep the next one if it's better. If it's, if it's worse by changing the alignment around, then we just get rid of it. And again, we're evaluating better and worse based on those three parameters, the um, cost of a substitution, the cost of a gap, and the cost of a gap extension. And so these evolutionary algorithms, to some extent, mimic what we're seeing in evolution with uh, random perturbations being like a random mutation or genetic drift. And then keeping better ones and throwing away worse ones is something that somewhat simulates natural selection. And so people have been working on these. And again, mathematically, we're not going to worry about them. But these, again, are very computationally intense. But the idea is that perhaps we could uh, navigate through a complex set of parameters and the search space to find the very best overall solution. And so again, we're, we're investing more resources in these uh, evolutionary genetic algorithms, uh, but with a hope to find an alignment that better approximates, at least according to our score, better approximates the true or actual alignment. But at the end, we never know for sure whether we've found that. Now, two special circumstances for alignments that I'm going to mention. Sometimes, based on the genes that we are trying to align, we might have additional information that helps us to make a better alignment and that would need to be added to these algorithms that are helping us to find the best alignment. So one example is ribosomal genes. Ribosomes have this secondary structure with, where parts of the RNA line up with other parts, sometimes very distantly. So in this case, the RNA starts here at the 3' prime end. Um, it ends there, I think, at the 5' prime end. And notice that there are parts that match and line up. So changes in one are going to have an influence on its partner one where it pairs and lines up. And so we could take that into account. And typically what you see with ribosomal alignments, like you did in worksheet number one, is that these areas where they match up, which are called stems, they tend to be very, very conserved with maybe just a couple of differences and a few little gaps here and there. But areas where they don't match up tend to be much more variable and harder to align because of that variability.
Okay, and so we might need to take that into account that this part matches another part 20 or 30 base pairs downstream. And so we could use that to help inform our alignment. And then, of course, we already mentioned this briefly, if we have a protein coding gene, it might be more helpful to look at the amino acid sequence, which is more conserved, than looking at the nucleotide sequence. And so we actually do the alignment in the amino acids and then go back and we can essentially untranslate it, go back to the nucleotide sequence and see that alignment. And so protein coding genes alignments are almost always done nowadays at the amino acid level rather than the nucleic acid level. So, to review, a multiple sequence alignment is a statement of homology across the entire sequence. And then even within that, we have statements of subhomology, so each column represents a single site or nucleotide that we say to be homologous. So we can kind of make an analogy. Remember when we talked about the vertebrate forelimb and how vertebrate forelimbs are homologous, but even within that forelimb, we could say, oh, look, we can compare the humerus of the bat to the humerus of the horse to the humerus of the frog, and we can compare those subcategories within it. So we can do the same for a DNA alignment. So each column represents a statement of homology, right? And so if there are differences, then we know that there must have been some sort of a mutation historically to make some species different from another. Okay, so remember that's what a multiple sequence alignment is, and just kind of know an overview, big picture view of those three types of sequence alignments and how they work. So to wrap up, I would like to take an alignment, a DNA alignment, and show you how we would use it. And we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail, but you should know very simply how to map characters. And these could be morphological characters, but we're because this is molecular evolution, we're going to use DNA data and review, show you how to map characters onto a phylogeny. So I have seven species with DNA sequence, this is artificial sequence, but DNA sequence to represent each of these species. And notice that they're fairly similar. I didn't put any gaps in, although we could have gaps, but we just have substitutions, okay? And many of the columns are identical. The little asterisk above it tells us everything below it is the same. And so, of course, if we have a column where everything is the same, there's no data there, no difference. Everything is the same as the ancestor was at that position. But at other places, we have differences. So we have substitutions. So we could look at this, and in the context of a phylogeny, we could determine where the most likely place is that that ancient substitution occurred. So let's take a look at this. So I'm going to make this um, smaller and kind of put it over here in the corner, put it on the side. And then we're going to look at a phylogeny. So let me bring this up here. Here's our phylogeny. Oops. Get some of these windows closed. So I've got two actually competing phylogenies here. And then I have a data set that we are wanting to use to evaluate these phylogenies. So if a character is rather simple, and we've kept these simple here, you can map them quite easily onto a phylogeny. Okay, so notice that for the first character here where there's difference, we've got an adenine for the first five species, but the firebrat and the shrimp have a guanine. Now, the simplest way to map that, and we're going to put a little bar here across um, branches to represent a change, and we'll, we'll label these as we go. Oops. So get this back. There we are. Okay, so we've got a little bar there representing a change. Now notice I've drawn that on a branch that separates the shrimp and the fire brat from all of the other species. So basically what I'm saying, if this is character number one, and we'll put a little one by it to help us remind, I'm saying that anciently in the ancestor of these five species, there was a mutation, and that G changed into an A. And so if we wanted to, and we typically don't do this just for simplicity's sake, but we could even put a little thing here saying what the mutation was. That G changed to an A, and we're going to represent that by putting a mark across that uh, branch. Okay, So that's a fairly simple one. Now notice over here, 
we could do the exact same thing. And I'm just going to cut and paste. It'll make it a little easier on me. And do the same thing because we have a same branch there that separates the grasshopper, cricket, fly, butterfly, and stink bug from the shrimp and the fire brat. So we have mapped our first character onto the phylogeny. And we have two different phylogenies here. Now notice, just on character one, we can't distinguish whether one of these phylogenies is better than the other. Okay? We're going to begin to introduce th th this idea, but I want you to be able to understand that these characters now can be put into their phylogenetic context. And so if I just looked at this alignment over here and didn't know anything about relationships, I would not know whether this was an ancient mutation that where a guanine mutated and became an adenine or an adenine mutated and became a guanine. But when I've got a phylogeny like this, it's rather easy to tell. The ancestor must have had a guanine, and the shrimp and the fire brat inherited that from the ancestor. However, a single mutation here in an ancestor of all of these species led to a difference there, an, a, a substitution. And so the ancestor of all these species at some point along that branch gained an adenine, it became fixed in that population, and then it passed it on to all of its descendants. And that's the simplest explanation for this pattern. Okay, so let's do a few more, and then I will let you practice work on the, more, on the rest of this alignment, and then you could uh, come back to, um, and, and check with me if you need to log on to one of the Zoom sessions. So character two, three, and four, we don't need to do anything because they're completely conserved. So it's silly to map them. If you wanted to, you could map them at the base, say the ancestor of all these must have had a thiamine for position two because they all have a thiamine. But that doesn't provide any help or anything meaningful for us. So we're going to skip ahead to character number five where we have another mutation. And this one, the fly and the butterfly have a guanine, and everything else has a thymine. So we're saying the fly and butterfly are different from all of the other species. Now, notice that on our first phylogeny here, we could map character number two. And I'm going to change this to a two, and we'll get rid of that little notation there. I can map it on a branch there that separate the fly and the butterfly from all other species. And so that's the simplest, best explanation for why the fly and the butterfly both share a guanine. And if I wanted, again, to put a little note, I don't need to do this, but the ancestor had a thymine, and then it mutated or changed to a guanine. All right, so that's character number two. Now, we've got a little bit of an issue over here. There is not a single branch that separates the fly and the butterfly from all of the other species. And this is a good illustration of a concept we already talked about. So there are two ways that we could map this onto the phylogeny, this phylogeny over here. We could say that there was a mutation, and it would be the same way. I don't have space, so I won't put it. But we could say there was a mutation where the thiamine changed into a guanine in the fly, and then there was another mutation where the thymine turned into a guanine in the ancestor of the butterfly. And so we would need to, both of those were, would be character number two. So we would need to put, um, actually, let's just do this. Ah, sorry, guys. Let's get rid of that little notation there. There we go. Okay. So we'll put a little two by both of these to represent. That is character number two, but we have to represent it twice on this phylogeny because the fly and the butterfly are not connected by a common ancestor that is separate from all the other species. So that's one way we could do that. Now in your mind, hopefully you're thinking, oh, that's convergence. Right? The fly and the butterfly got a separate mutation independently. And so they look similar, but not because they got it from a common ancestor, but because of convergence. Now, there's another explanation for why the, the um, fly and the butterfly share that trait. And so we could map it this way instead. We could map it in the ancestor of the fly, the butterfly, and the stink, stink bug, so all of those. And then we could map it again 
character number two there. Now, if I was going to put the notations by these, let's go ahead and do that. So hopefully it'll be clear to you. This one represents a change from that ancestor. And again, remember, we're looking at character number five over here. The ancestral thymine changed into a guanine. But here, because we have a guanine that's now established in this ancestor, this would be a reversion where the guanine changes back into a thymine. But notice for character number two, we've still only had to map it on there twice. So whether we map it as a convergence, as we did earlier, in the lineage leading to the fly and in the lineage leading to the butterfly, or a plesiomorphy, right, which is what we've mapped here, a symplesiomorphy, gained in the ancestor, lost in one of the descendants. We've got to do it in a more complex manner than on this phylogeny. And so in later, the next discussion, actually, we'll start to talk about why, whether we prefer this phylogeny to this one based on our characters. And now we would continue and keep moving on and on and on and map each of the characters where there is variability. We would map it onto our phylogeny. Okay, So you should be able to do that. And if you want to practice and then review it with me, we can review it during a Zoom session or you can make an appointment. We can do that. I'm just going to do one more just to make a point. Sometimes characters that have variability are still not useful for helping us understand about relationships of organisms. So, for instance, this character right here where the fly has a guanine and all the other species have a, have a cytosine, we can map that onto the phylogeny, and I guess that would be character, let's see, one, two, we've got one there, three. We would call this character number four because it's the fourth character where there's variability. Um, but if we needed to do that, uh, let's go ahead and map that on there. Notice that when it's present only in one species, we can always map it, no matter what, on the branch leading to that species. So it's not going to be ever be helpful or informative about phylogenies because it's only found in one species. And we already knew that species was different. This is one of the defining characteristics that makes that species unique and different from all other species on Earth. Okay, So that's technically called an apomorphy. It's when we have a character in one species and none of the other species in our data set share that character. And so those are not useful for helping us find relationships. But other characters that are shared between species potentially could be very useful helping us distinguish between phylogenies. And in our next discussion, we'll talk about methodologies that we use to take our data and then determine whether phylogeny A is better than phylogeny B. Now, the last thing that I want you to recognize is these are only two of tens of thousands of possible phylogenies we would have for seven species. And so we're only evaluating is if one is better than two, but in reality, in a computer program, we would need to evaluate is one, is it better than two through 9,857, is it better than all of those? And we could potentially evaluate all of them for small data sets like this. But as data sets get bigger and bigger, we begin to run into the same problem that we talked about with alignment, that we have so many phylogenies that even our fastest computers are not able to analyze all of the possible solutions. And so we are left with a different approach where we can search a large portion of our phylogenies, but not all of them. And so we'll begin to get into that and talk about that in the coming lectures.